things have got to change around here. He's right. Things have got to change because all I have is a boo-boo kit. In today's video, we're talking with Nick Miller, who is a professional paramedic and instructor who's got a lot of experience. And we realized that, yeah, we've got a bunch of stuff, but we need some work on organization. And there's some things that we need to add that really makes sense that we didn't even think of. So in today's video, Nick's going to discuss with us the different types of first aid kits, how they're different and how you can build it to tailor them directly to your needs. Hey, Profit and Preppers, I'm Kyleen. And I'm Jonathan. Today we are back with Nick Miller, talking about first aid kits. And this is going to be a two-part series. So this is part one. Make sure you don't miss part two because this is going to be a lot of really good information. So Nick, take just a minute and tell us about yourself, where you've been, why you're qualified to teach us about first aid. Sure, my name is Nick Miller. I'm a longtime paramedic and a longtime paramedic instructor, paramedic professor. I've taught all over the country. I've taught military special forces. I'm a certified EMS instructor, many states. So one of the few things I don't really teach is first aid because I teach everything above that. But first aid is the core. And a lot of the stuff we teach in our EMR class or an EMT class is first aid. I am also like to backpack a lot. And I like to go out in the woods and hide for weeks on end. And um, at least when I was younger, when the ground wasn't so hard. I always was looking for the right size first aid kit that would actually be useful and could save a life as well as take care of I'm sick and boo-boos. And, and I was a little disappointed in what I found. So it's been like a 15 year quest we're gonna talk about. So I had no idea that a kit that's in our basic automotive kit would take longer to talk about than the automotive kit. I wanna take the time to explain why we put certain items in there and why they need to be in there and why not. And the goal from this is one, you'll know what to put in your kit and two, what you don't need in your kit. And three, understand some of the nomenclature because um, you watch a lot of the other prepper videos are talking about tactical stuff and IFACs and all this stuff you need. And we're going to get into that to understand it from a lay person point of view, not a not an infantryman's point of view. That's my goal for today. As someone who's taught PJs and Navy SEALs, I, I, I can speak a little bit on civilian versus military medicine. So does that sound good? That sounds fantastic. This is going to be part one of a two-part video because we wanted to make sure that we were able to give you as much information as we could from Nick. So I'll give you everything that I give everyone else. So you'll be in the know. Today, we're going to talk about first aid kits in general, but we're going to focus on what I call the SMAC or the small medical aid kit. This is a collection of some of the bags I've collected over time. So I've been had a 15-year quest to find right pack. So on the left are some of the, we have a, these are professional rescuer packs on the left side here, an EMT, EMR level, paramedic level are the last two that I used to carry when I was a paramedic and I had to respond from my own vehicle. In the middle are IFACs, our military um, first aid kits we'll talk about. And then over here on the last two rows are just a few of the kits I, I bought, which annoys my wife to no end. She's like, can we sell these? You, you collect them more than women collect purses. I get yelled at quite a bit. After 15 years of trying to study this, I learned that no one else is. That's the first thing I learned from <laughs> very few people. There's no such thing as the perfect first aid kit. So just do that. I think a lot of people just go to Walmart or Target. They think they're going to buy a first aid kit, throw it in the trunk, and they're going to live happily ever after. And if something bad happens, it's going to have exactly what they need. It's going to be a miracle. Not true. Some are better than others, but all are have limitations. I mean, you can only put so much stuff in a kit. You know, you can, you're not going to have a magical surgical suite pop out when you open the lid. They're all going to need, especially if you buy commercial, tweaking, additions, augmenting of some kind. So when we look at commercial kits or ones that are pre-stocked, there's a wide variance from everything from the color. I have seen first aid kits in every color imaginable. That can be confusing under stress. They have a whole bunch of different quality of products. Some are in just cheap plastic boxes. Some are in really good cases. They, as you can see, they're all different sizes. The commercial kits always designed for profit first. You tend to have lesser quality equipment as a general rule. I'll find plastic tweezers instead of quality tweezers. I'll find little baby tiny scissors instead of quality EMT shears. I'll find all sorts of lesser things that I wouldn't like because under stress, things break. 
even bandages, like a lot of the commercial will use a four ply gauze pad versus the standard is a 12 ply. So buyer beware. Commercial, the professional rescue kits are a lot better, but they too can be lacking. Here is the wall in our safety team room at church. We have a couple of us are medics. So this is what we'll grab if someone goes down at church. And we just started with a pre-made commercial kit. And then when I got it, I tweaked it. And that's what most people do even on the ambulance. They'll either buy an empty bag and make their own, or they'll take an existing kit and tweak it. This is professional level here. Notice the size is a lot bigger. Notice we have an AED for a car attack and we have stop the bleed kits. Now, these are the ones that we grab and are portable. We also have them stationed in every floor as well. You, you have to take the time to learn about kits and, and decide for you what you need in your kit and make it your own. And that's going to be a recurring theme we're going to talk about. Here's the commercial aid kit designs I showed you. One thing I wanted to handle is few kits are really capable of handling a true emergency. And even the ANSI kits are bare minimum. Like these little green and lime and orange, at least for down here, these little bags, they, they're they like boo-boo kits. They'll give you a Band-Aid. So as long as you don't have anything worse than a boo-boo on your finger, you're good to go. As a general rule, but not always, price will give a clue to quality. When you start seeing quality kits, they're going to be at least 100, 150 bucks, 200 bucks to have the quality stuff if you're buying it commercially. And because they also have to put a profit margin in. So it might be more economical for you to make one. It, it may not. Commercial kits, a lot of times, are designed for the workplace. So like if you went to a Target or Walmart and got one of those little tackle box kits, it'll say somewhere meets the ANSI standard. I'm glad to say I found out since we did our automotive kit, um, they updated from 2015 to 2021 standards. So they finally added the emergency blanket. And in the class B, they finally added a tourniquet and clarified it has to be an actual um, tourniquet for arterial bleeding, not for a IV. Even ANSI says that you're going to have to augment your kit to fit your situation. If you want meds in your kit, they're not on the required list, but you add them. They suggest you do. If you need other things like stop the bleed kits or anything else like that, you have to add them. Commercial kits, also, like I said, they have the bare minimum quality. Now, the one thing that a lot of people get confused and a lot of preppers, especially those that are into zombie apocalypse and, and guns, is the IFAC. So the IFAC started out as a JFAC in World War II, a jungle first aid kit, which is the little red cross up here. And then by Vietnam, it basically became this little pouch you wore on your shoulder that had a trauma dressing. That pretty much stayed through all the way through to Afghanistan and Tora Bora in 2001, 2003. And then the... Um, Military doctors realized that their survival rates were no better than Vietnam. So they did some serious studies on this. Um, the Commission on Trauma Tactical Casualty Care was formed. They did all these things. And they learned that there were a couple things that were easily preventable. And they accessed the strategic financial reserves for the first time since the Second World War. And what they did was they bought about 250,000 IFACs for every soldier in Iraq and Afghanistan and throughout the military. And that alone has greatly reduced the amount of preventable deaths. The IFACT is an old military acronym for individual first aid kit. But these ever since 01, they're, they're, not, they're not first aid kits anymore. They are a trauma response kit for those military guys who are dealing with big holes from gunshot wounds and bombs. You have to realize that some of those items in those kits are not for a lay person to use. So I watch all these videos and they'll put in um, decompression needles to decompress a, uh, a collapsed lung. Unless you're a paramedic, you should not be doing that. That is a paramedic and physician level skill. And I think some of these people think they're going to pull out this needle if they're shot in the chest and stick themselves with it. And that's not going to happen. Those things are put in there for military medics when they see that person to use on that patient. Just be aware of that when you see those in some of the kits. And those needles are expensive. They're like 30 bucks each. So if you wonder why your kit's so expensive, that's one of the reasons. So just realize IFACs are very specialized. They're not a true first aid kit. They're not a general purpose first aid kit. They are for trauma only. So let's talk about first aid kits. If I don't know how much you've looked in the first aid kits on your end, but they go from little tiny little pocket size all the way up to big backpacks and more. With smaller kits, the advantage is they're portable. They'll fit in other kits very easily. They'll fit in your backpack or purse. 
They're lighter weight. If you're a backpacker, you love that because ounces equal pounds and pounds equal pain. On the flip side, though, you, you can hold less items. So you have to be very careful what you pick in that pack. And a lot of commercial kits only choose boo-boos and forget about oh my. The smaller your kit, the more you have to improvise. Conversely, with a larger pack, you have a lot more equipment, a lot more types of equipment. You can handle better things, but they're heavier. They don't go into other packs or a backpack easily. When you're doing this, you have to think about is this, how portable does this first aid kit need to be? Am I walking with it? Am I just keeping it on the wall in, in, in the uh, garage? You know, what, where and what am I needing this kit to do? So, so this makes little... a, a really good case for having several different first aid kits. I mean, it, it seems like you for different kinds of things, maybe one that you pack with you to school or to work is going to be a lot different than one that you have in your car or you have in your home. Yes and no. I, I think the more more different types of kits you have, the more you have to learn kits. So like on the ambulance, all our trucks were different because some were older, some were newer, some were one style, some the other, but every bag was identical. So I would always learn the bag first because I knew exactly where everything was in that bag. You have to, you have to think about that. So I'm going to talk about that here a little bit in these rules and explain the balance point from my years of official or unofficial academic research, meaning me in my basement when my wife wasn't around. First aid kits, in my opinion, and this is why they also should never get too big. They should be used by lay people who have no minimal to no training. If, if a lay person can't use it, it's not a first aid kit. It's a professional rescuer kit. Those are very different things. The second thing I think we talked about earlier was that you have to realize that a commercial kit does not come with everything you need. You have to make sure you have what you need. I know a lot of people, I, I've watched it as a paramedic. They thought they had this kit. They bought it Target and it's a box and it's there. And they go to open it and they realize that kit does not have anything that they can do to deal with a big arterial bleed or an unconscious person. Even ANSI says this in that document that was really made nice by Granger that we put in the um, automotive safety kit, that attachment on the blog. But even ANSI says, you're going to have to augment your kit to make it work for you. So you're going to have to take ownership of this kit. You can't just go buy one in Target and forget about it. Every first aid kit's going to have its limitations. A first aid kit is not the same kit that I carried as a paramedic in the ambulance. My mini kits in my bag were bigger than most first aid kits. And then here's some paradoxes about first aid kits. The larger the kit is, the better it is, the less likely you're going to take it with you. Why? Because it's big and it's heavy. I know this just playing football with my kid, you know, I'd be like, do I really want to drag this first aid kit all the way to the bleachers? And then I thought, well, I don't want to have to walk or run all the way to my car and all the way back. So is this, which one, which laziness was going to win? The smaller the kit, the more likely you'll throw it in your little purse or your backpack and you'll take it with you. The less likely you take the kit with you, the more likely you're going to need it. You ever run into that? Man, where is that? I made this kit. I'm ready to go. Mm -hmm. Now I don't have it. I call that Murphy's Law. For me, it was anything that can go wrong will go wrong on my shift. Three small first aid kits that are strategically placed are far better than one large first aid kit. Because a lot of times, especially in emergency, it's about getting something done in the first three minutes. Think about that when you're building kits. Like I have a kit on every floor in my room. They're not giant kits, but at least that gets me to stop the bleeding. So then I can go downstairs or have my wife or someone go downstairs to get my big paramedic kit or to call 911, or to make that stop gap. Another good thing about first aid kits is use the combined power of several small kits to act as one large kit, especially when you're traveling with groups or and especially when you're traveling on foot. So when I go hiking with my wife and kid, all three of us have the same small first aid kit. So if I need extra stuff, I can pull from those other kits. And together, it makes about the size of one kit. Plus, I'm not carrying the weight. That's very similar to the IFAT concept the military took. That combat medic can't carry all that stuff, so the, the soldier carries it on their person. And it's standardized, and everyone knows where it is and where everything's located, and that medic can find it. The kit has to be able to address these three major things. Minor wounds, which most first aid kits do okay with. Common illnesses, which you're going to have to augment your kit to do and life-threatening emergencies. 
An ANSI kit will at least have a five by nine compound, which you could use as a trauma dressing. But most first aid kits don't address unresponsive airways. They don't address some of the other more serious stuff. And, and of course, there's a limitation to that because as a lay person, there's only so much you can do. So there's not a lot of equipment, but there are some things you can get. And then what's not in the kit will have to be improvised. The more medical training you have, the better you can use that kit and improvise. So training is very important. Another thing to realize, and I think it's a lot of lay people, this could be from TV, could be just from not understanding, whatever. But they have to realize the first aid kit is just that. It's first aid. If a person is seriously injured, they're going to need more aid than that kit can provide. You're going to need to call 911. Are you going to need to get them to better care? The first aid kit will not save a critically ill or injured patient. What they will do, though, is they will buy you time to get the ambulance there and then to get to the hospital for that definitive care. An example of this is if I have a major bleed, an arterial bleed in my arm, that first aid kit won't save my life. But that first aid kit will stop the bleeding so I can get to the hospital so the doctor can save me. I used to tell my students all the time, paramedics do not save lives. We prolong death. Doctors save lives. Nurses heal. We prolong death. That's exactly what a first aid kit does in a severe life-threatening situation. It prolongs death. Buys you that time. The thing also you have to remember is first aid kits will be used under stress. If anyone ever got the bejesus scared out of you, that's the adrenaline response. So think about that. If you ever got scared to death, your heart's pounding, you can't think straight, you're flushed, you're looking all over, your fingers are tingling, you can't work right, your gripping is weak. Those are all from that magical drug called adrenaline. So when you make a kit, when you buy a kit, when you prepare a kit, you must make sure it's easy to see, easy to find, easy to identify. In easy to use for the lay person under stress. So that's why we talk about how that we have good pockets in there to hold things so they don't blow away or get knocked out if we drop it. You know, we make sure the zippers can work well. And then back to Jonathan's comment, I have found that it's better to have just two standard sizes, a small and a comprehensive. That way I only have to learn two kits. I know one kid has everything and I know what my one kid has. So that's better than having 23 different kits in every different room. You know, the military standardizes everything for a reason so that everyone knows what it is and how it works. That's why the military doesn't let everyone carry their own pistol. There's people that want the 45s back. Some people want the nine. Some people carry a 22. But you're in combat and you're relying on each other. You have to all have the same thing. You use the same ammo. Say the police department. They all have the same gun, the same everything. In the ambulance with our bags, we have everything in the same bag in the same pocket. So, if you have two standard sizes and your family, that way anyone in your family or at your workplace will know exactly how that kid is set up and where it is. And that'll take away a lot of stress and that'll take away a lot of time lost trying to figure out where something is. So the small kit, I just call it an SFAC. You want the small kit to be easy to carry and pack. My small kit goes with me all over the country in my backpack. My small kit is in my get home bag. My small kit is in the basic kit for my wife, the automotive kit. I try to keep that weight as close to or less than one and a half pounds. Because I even made a bigger individual kit that was like two, two and a half pounds. And that was just too much. Didn't fit in the backpack easy. It didn't fit around. And a small kit will take care of one to two people. Comprehensive first aid kit, or what I call a CFAC. Now you can have all your equipment. This kit will be big enough to hold an ANSI Class B first aid equipment, those 50 Band-Aids, that cat tourniquet, that four ounces of saline water, all that stuff can be held in this size kit. So if you are at a workplace or you have a small business and you need to keep an OSHA kit, go with the comprehensive. This should be able to take care of four plus people easily. I mean, when you got 50 Band-Aids and all this extra stuff, but with any kit, even the comprehensive, if you had to use a tourniquet, there's only one tourniquet in the kit. So realize when they say four people, there, there are limitations to that number. I, I cannot find any documentation where people come up with that number. It's just that person's best guess. You have to look at make sure if it works for you. The minimum weight I find on these is three to four pounds. Notice this is a minimum weight because you can make one as big as you want and hold as much as you want. I think a shoe box is that optimal size. It's still comprehensive and it's still portable. The small first aid kit should be able to fit in all these places. 
anywhere from the basic auto kit we did last week to a, a glove box in the car, a desk drawer, a backpack pocket. So my my small back I took to school every day when I taught, I had it in the front pocket there. And then my get home bag, it's in the top pocket. So I can pull it out pretty quick. If you have a kid at school, you can put it in a locker, put it in your, your kayak or your boat or your motorcycle. And you can even put it on your belt if you wanted to. The larger case here is, here's the larger case about the size of a shoe box. It should be able to fit in the trunk of a vehicle, teacher's cabinet, you know, decent place. And that's why I like that shoe box size. It's comprehensive, but it still fits in a lot of places. This is actually in my garage right next to the door to go into the kitchen. So this is my emergency station for the main level. So here they are open. As we talked about before, you want to have the pockets so things don't blow away. So here's the comprehensive versus the small one. And the question, the big million dollar question is how do we shrink it so that, but it still keep it as effective as the big one. And how we're going to do that is we're going to take out some items. We're going to have five band-aids instead of 50. We're going to use smaller items. We're going to use four, three by threes instead of four by fours. We're going to vacuum seal, which a lot of the military does. Here's like this bandage right here, the, this white one and the small one is vacuum sealed, but I use a food saver if I think it's worth it. I, I convert my food saver to a vacuum sealer. I will improvise, it doesn't fit in the kit. So my smaller kit doesn't have a tourniquet, but we'll improvise. And then I'll immediately have to restock it. Restocking, it's more important with the smaller kit. I might be able to go the whole week without restocking my comprehensive kit if I'm at camp or something, but my small kit, as soon as I use it, I wanna replace it right away. The small first aid kit, Again, we talked about before, clearly marked, under stress, a big symbol is much easier than trying to read words. I like a big symbol. So we talked about either the, the, the ISO green on white or the Geneva Convention red on white. High quality material. Um, soft cases, I think, tend to work better than hard cases for the smaller pack. Notice that they have to be able to hang on a wall. So even my small one can hang on the wall with this handle. I have these pull tabs so that the zipper is open easily. I can pull them easily under stress. I have the, these little hook closures so I can put it to a belt or attach it to something else. And if you're going to be waterproof, so the one in my bug out bag, I have it in a waterproof little OSPI three liter bag. So if I suddenly fall in the water or something, it's not going to get soaked. So this would be a good place to stop because now we can start talking about the items. Hopefully, if you have any questions on what the difference is and what a first aid kit is, what a first aid kit isn't, what size we should get, we, I, we've covered that. And if you have any questions, just put them in the uh, comments below and I'll try to answer them for you. All right. So that that's great. So now we understand the basics, right? And I've mm -hmm. learned a few things that I think we need to implement. Absolutely. Like, yeah, I can't there's... wait to get to the rest of this. I think first, right now, I need to work on finding out what kind of kit I need to get, right? And strategically where I'm going to place these. Lots of great information, Nick. I can't wait for the other one. Yeah, now we get the nitty gritty. So for the question of the day, what have you learned? Now that you've got more information from a professional, how are you going to improve your first aid kits? Comment below. And thanks for being part of the solution.